हेलो एवरीवन आई एम ज्योति जोशी एंड वेलकम बैक टू आवर चैनल टॉप न्यूज नेटवर्क इन दिस एपिसोड ऑफ टॉक विद टॉप्स वी हैव विद अस द स्पेशल एडवाइजर फॉर गवर्नमेंट ऑफ जिम्बाब्वे मिस्टर राज शेखर रे वेलकम टू द शो सर थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर हैविंग मी हियर uh let's start with your earlier life you were born in calcutta then moved to south africa with your family so share some of your childhood memories and tell us about your education okay um i was very lucky born in calcutta um at the age of 4 4 1/2 i moved to a country called zambia which is in southern part of africa okay. just above uh, south africa um that was because of my father he got a job with a multinational company so we went there i started my schooling in zambia that's where my love affair with africa started um and um basically initial schooling was in um, zambia and after a while i think i started uh, probably it was in the 6th standard i had to come back because of the you know education standards not being very high at that point in time and coming from an indian family i came back to boarding school in india in northern india um called woodstock school it's a international um a school with you know i during my time we had about students from 18 nationalities so that in itself was an experience which was the foundation for what i am doing currently today okay after my boarding school when i had completed my boarding school uh, i had a choice uh, you know it was primarily about 60 70% of my class graduating class went to america i also had the same dreams of going moving to america um i was very disappointed because it was the time when the gulf first gulf war broke out so a lot of us couldn't obtain financial aid and i didn't come from a family where i could afford very high you know fees although you know came from a good family but i didn't want to put pressure on my you know family so i said let me try maybe i'll start my you know college here and then maybe try again uh luck had it that you know i got it into commerce and um when my family moved to mumbai from where i did my chartered accountancy and you know i'd left my dream of going to america and just got into the corporate world in india um started my career with a pharmaceutical company um and then worked with various industries verticals from it to social marketing i worked for probably the second largest social marketing company in the world um ran very good campaigns you know is to work on probably the largest hiv aids intervention program at that point in time this was in about 1999 2000 uh so everywhere there was a great learning experience um and uh, from there i left the corporate uh, world in 2004 where my life actually really changed um i got involved in something called international debt collection and this was something the reason how i got involved was one fine day i opened the newspaper um i see a classified ad in times of india saying looking for a executive assistant to a very wealthy nri um and the all it said was the requirement for the job they didn't ask for any qualification nothing it said you must be willing to travel and i looked at it and i said what more i could travel the world at somebody else's expense and also learn in the process so i just put in my ad and I, i never uh, till that point uh, i'd always got my jobs by reference like somebody would call me and say are you looking for a job so i would you know just go and interview and i was selected so i never actually applied for a job this was the first time i actually sent my cv in for a job and i forgot about it i went on holiday forgot about it and then i get a call um saying would you like to come for an interview so i go in there um and this is something that i would also like you know youngsters who are listening in over here that you be presented with opportunities so here i go in for an interview we are made to wait i go in there at 10 o'clock in the morning at a five star hotel in mumbai we are kept in the lobby the interview is happening on the fourth or fifth floor the nri has come down uh, from east africa he's recruiting and nobody comes down offers us a cup of coffee nothing i was the last to be interviewed there were 40 people interviewed i waited i was patient many left in between now that also speaks about how you know you have to wait be patient and you know i eliminated my competition at that point many people thought this is not the right employer you know so i was called in at about 5 o'clock i walk into the room it was a suite the best room in that hotel there was this gentleman seated he didn't even get up to greet me when i walked in through the door so i looked at him and i said how rude could a person be and he said yes please come in introduce myself 
I later realized that he was half his body was paralyzed. This was a man at the age of, he was probably about 63, 64 then. From head to toe, paralyzed. Non-resident Indian, Indian origin person in Africa. Very wealthy person. He used to travel on a wheelchair 250 days a year. He wanted to make me his assistant. He didn't ask me any question of what background, where. He just asked me my name. And he saw in that, that I grew up in Zambia. That was my ticket to that job. So I, would, I thank my father for having taken me to Africa. And this is how, you know, destiny plays a big role. You, we put in our efforts, but you have to also, you know, take the, seize the opportunities that come in. I later realized after joining, there were 400 applicants for that position. And I was the one who had to dispose of so many of those CVs. And that's how my life started with international debt. What we did in international debt was we used to go government to government. There's a lot of outstanding commercial debt. This is something that is um, basically trade and financed, you know, trade and commerce takes place. And a lot of times there's not a payment for the goods and services that come in. So this is between the two governments. They appoint consultants and, you know, third parties like international banks and all of that to go in. So here I was given an opportunity to work with an individual, very well connected man. The first day I land up in my job in Africa, he takes me straight into the former president of that country. And here I, I am, I was so nervous, never ever sat even in this kind of environment. How do I behave? How do I sit? So all of that. And today, you know, when I look back, I, you know, that's my learning process. Today I walk in, I sit with the same heads of state independently with not having anybody setting up my meetings with them. Rather, it's the other way around. Now I'm helping a lot of international businessmen, industrialists have those kind of meetings. That's where, you know, I can, in summary, I can say this is where I am today. Okay. Uh, so as you said, you completed most of your education in India. Yes. So uh, what are your views about the education system of India and how much do you think your alma mater has contributed to your success? Hugely. In terms of schooling, if I were to say my boarding school, having, you know, 80 different nationalities, uh, you learn so many different, at a very early age, you learn so many different cultures, you know, the traditions, you learn to respect different cultures, different religions, you know, we, we live in a society, you know, like currently, we have these things of people being intolerant and all, so you, that's a great learning exercise way, I, you know, didn't know, my, I had some of the best friends who were from Pakistan, it's only when you come out of school and you realize that, you know, when you start reading all of this, but in school, you never differentiated whether somebody was a Christian, Hindu, Muslim, none of that. We were all so great friends. We have our friendship even today. We have, you know, alumni meeting around the world. We try and all meet up. So that's one on the schooling part. Then coming to the uh, to university, I found that, you know, the competitive spirit that is in India, you know, just the rat race that we're all involved in, you know, we all want to be doctors, engineers. Of course, now a lot of, you know, career options have opened up. You know, you're free to pursue, you know, your passion. Uh, if somebody is very good at maybe, you know, cooking is his passion. Today he can pursue a profession in that. Dance, earlier days, you know, you just have very select, you know, in terms of when you're talking about dance, then you've got so many entertainment. The, you know, options for um, the youth of uh, the current generation, far greater. And it, I guess it's much more. In my time, I had much, many more opportunities that may, say my father would have had, you know, coming in. So... The education system definitely helped. Not to say that, you know, it's the best. It's always, you know, we're changing, you know, trying to be, you know, adapting to the times that we live in. Um, and, um, but I would always say that it's definitely played a big role. And now, it, even apparent when we go travel internationally, you see so many, you know, Indians who are occupying global positions. All of them will have one thing in common. It's how they've come up in the Indian system. Yes, they've, most of them, like when you talk about America and all, they've gone and taken, you know, um, degrees from there as well. But it's the foundation that built, you know, from India. So I'm also one of the products, you know, of the Indian education system. Okay. Uh, tell us about the hardships that you had to go through in your career and what were the lessons learned from it? Hardships, uh, different types of hardships. I wouldn't say that I was, you know, fairly privileged in that I didn't have, you know, 
you know, family to support back, you know, parents and those kind of things. So I had a privileged background where I was free to do, I could select you know, the kind of job I would get in. It wasn't like, you know, whatever came my way because I had, you know, four people to feed, you know, those kind of things coming from, a, you know, a rural to a city setting. You don't, you're not given too many choices. You take what you get. So from that point of view, I wouldn't say I've had great hardships, but yes, everybody, there's, you know, even the most successful person in the world, you know, the, the wealthiest individual will at some stage have faced some kind of hardship. The kind of hardship I would have faced is, yeah, um, you know, not getting the job that you desire to get. One is you've trained for something and you don't get what you want to, you know, actually work on. Then you work, go into a corporate setup where, you know, you've got, you know, maybe 500,000 employees and then you suddenly realize, whoa, now I need to compete with so many of them to get to where I need to. So from that point of view, those are the hardships you have to go through. Um, uh, but it also makes you a stronger person, you know, coming out. Um, I just decided, you know, at one stage I saw, you know, I just didn't want to go into the negative aspect of corporate world, you know, uh, uh, competition um, and, you know, dirty politics and, you know, stepping on different people's toes, getting up there. So I just thought, let me try, you know, leave that because I'm not cut out for that. You know, maybe, yes, I may make it to the top, but at what cost? So I just decided it's not worth that, you know, I lose my sleep and I just decided, let me just try and do something. Yes, I took time off, came out, people discouraged me, but the biggest support I had was, again, it's always your near and dear ones. If they are supportive, you can do anything. So I was lucky to have a family support system. Initially, they were discouraging, but end of the day, they said, no, if it's your dream, try and achieve what you want to do. I'm lucky that it's worked out in my favor. Today, a lot of people will come and say, yes, we, we knew, we told you, you were going to be successful. But yes, there were enough cynics at that time in my close family. People would say, you know, this is not a job, you know, that job I'm talking about for the NRI. Um, I used to pick up a suitcase. Here I've done, my chartered accountancy article shape worked in corporate India and people were seeing me sometimes in a hotel, I'm picking up somebody's suitcase, putting him into the car. They did not realize that that was one part. When we were sitting, I was given responsibility, which even his family did not want to get involved in. He had very successful children. They're running multi-million dollar enterprises in, around the world now but they were not interested in the father's business. So this was an opportunity and the father said, my own family doesn't, why don't you try and do, take whatever, take up my contacts. So today, whatever I'm able to do, the network I've built up is thanks to that gentleman having opened the door for me. And I'm very grateful to him, his family, that, you know, I'm grateful to the family they didn't take up, so it gave me an opportunity to come in. Um, but yeah, I guess that's uh, how life is. Uh, how would you describe this journey from Calcutta to Zimbabwe or let's say from Chartered Accountant to Special Advisor to the Zimbabwe Government? Uh, it's been a wonderful journey. Um, the ups and downs are always there. Luckily, I've had more ups than the downs. Um, Africa, you know, I just realized uh, having grown up there, I've seen the, you know, the best part. A lot of people not in India especially are not aware because of the kind of marketing that happens, you know, globally, media carries frontline media. They carry stories of famine and all of this, uh, jungle and all, but it's a different world out there. You know, we have very modern cities like in South Africa, we have a city called Cape Town, a lot of people associate with. A lot of our in Hindi movies are shot in South Africa for many years now. It's not just recently. So yes, sometimes they even shot as if they're shot in Europe. So the Indian audience is thinking that's in European, but it's actually shot in Cape Town or you know, in the vicinity of Cape Town. So Africa, wonderful place. Um, I would always, you know, they call me, a lot of these countries, they, you know, they privately, they say, you are our greatest you know, ambassador kind of thing. We have a lot of people like me, Indian origin people who are there trying to promote you know, our country, trying to promote Africa in India. Um, and the more we get, the awareness will increase. Um, and I'm sure, you know, um, we're a population of more than 1.3 billion. Uh, I always, you know, joke with a lot of those African countries that, you know, you need more Indians over here because some countries are very small. Mm. You know, when we walk in, I just say the city like Mumbai. I come from a city of Mumbai where 25 million people. So that's more than double the population. It's sometimes four, five times the population of some of the African countries. Mm. So it's overwhelming for them. So how can we also 
teach them so many things from our side. So that's what we're doing. It could be business, it could be entertainment, arts, and we have great, you know, great, great engagement between government, you know, government of India and the different governments in Africa. Uh, tell us something about the economic development of Zimbabwe as you are working there for, as a special advisor yes. and what's your contribution in the economy? Yes, I'm actually basically a special advisor to the Ministry of Finance and Government of Zimbabwe. There was a recent change in government uh, in uh, December. Um, so I was appointed in January this year um, primarily to bring the economy back on track and given that India plays, you know, we are one of the sort of emerging economic superpowers, so to say, we would at least believe as Indians as well, uh, we can play a great role. And that is how I was approached because of my background, what I was doing and, you know, with the people who are currently in government, they identified and said, why don't you help us bring investment? Just to give you a little background for all the viewers. Uh, Zimbabwe, I think maybe a couple of years ago, it became the joke of the world where it saw the highest inflation ever. You know, there was a trillion dollar note and there were few, you know, that's how much inflation. I don't know for people who don't understand. Inflation is basically cost of goods going up from what is available today. If something I get something for 10 rupees today, it will be available for say 12 rupees. Okay, so that's 20% inflation a year down the road. Now they had trillion percent inflation. We had an interesting case and I would like the audience to know there was a time in Zimbabwe about eight to nine years ago. If you walked into the supermarket, you saw a loaf of bread. Let's say the price in the local currency is say one dollar. By the time you reach the payment queue, it's already become one dollar twenty cents. By the time you move from the shelf to the payment counter. Nowhere in the world, I, I have not heard of any other place in the world where this was happening. So how do you survive? You had people bringing cash in wheelbarrows, you know, bringing in a car hole just to buy your grocery for one week. So from that, they suddenly, you know, they again got rid, they didn't have their currency went, their Zimbabwe dollar, it crashed completely. Now it's the US dollar is the currency out there. It's coming back on track right now. So people like us are trying to help bring foreign investment in. Um, there is a lot of engagement from government of India where we're supporting with, you know, long term, you know, uh, financial aid and loan that to help, you know, uh, projects come on stream, infrastructure and all, and rehabilitate the general economy. And that's the primary role that I play. Uh, regarding Zimbabwe, uh, just for our audience, you know, especially in India, uh, those who are not really aware, um, of course, to an Indian, Zimbabwe is famous for cricket. They, they play cricket, they come in, we beat them nowadays, you know. Um, but uh, Zimbabwe is a country with wonderful tourism. They've got a great uh, Victoria Falls, you know, that um, people from India on, around the world go to visit. Um, for a uh, lot of people may not be aware that they have such great natural resources, um, which, for example, they have gold, they have uh, platinum, one top three uh, reserves in the world. Uh, they have chrome, chrome, all these things, they basically are like in the steel industry, you know. So it's basically mining is a very big uh, industry out there. They have the largest chrome reserve in the world um, and um, iron ore. So this is something that, uh, you know, in one way, this is waiting to be, I wouldn't say exploited, exploited is a very negative word. Uh, is basically, you know, to uh, value add on those resources. So one of the things that we are working on right now is to bring investors who will, you know, typically what has happened, why these African countries have been, uh, you know, left behind, their natural resources have been taken. Something for a dollar goes out of their country. It's the value, nine dollars is added and sold as ten dollars back into those countries. So now they're, all the African countries want value add to happen in their country. They also want the taxes coming out of it. So that's one of the things. Zimbabwe's also got great, a lot of diamonds. Uh, that's something that India, you know, we buy a lot of diamonds uh, for, from Zimbabwe. So this is basically, you know, in terms of the economy um, and of course tourism and then people to people relationship. These are all now increasing gradually as we go along. Okay. So how would you describe success? Success, okay. Success for different people, different things, you know. Naturally, most of us, we measure success by typically the usual way, wealth. Uh, how much money, how many cars do you have, you know, 
how big is your bungalow and all of that, we would all believe, yes, I, I'd be lying to myself if, you know, that was not one of the criteria. But for me personally, for me, I feel I've achieved what I had set out to do. Maybe 20 years ago, if somebody told me that, Raj, 20 years from now, uh, you would be, you know, be able to walk in to you know, head of state in a country um, like and the years are given to you to say you know okay what do you suggest and you're taken seriously so when it's just not you know uh, lip service that they're giving me they're saying seriously okay Raj we, what do we need to do as a country to improve and I say you need to do one two three four and I see the government implementing something something like that a classic case is my appointment because when the people approach, I said, I can only help you if I have an official engagement. Because otherwise, who am I? How do I represent your country? They said, fine, whatever you need. Okay, here's your official appointment. You are the special advisor to our government. Now, you can go out to the market. You can go international. It's not restricted only to India. Yes, I'm an Indian, so I would like to promote Indian enterprise coming in and all. But it's open anywhere. Indians, we've got the diaspora. America, everywhere, I'm trying to attract them to come into Zimbabwe. And seeing what I'm doing here, it's also attracted very, in my network, other countries are also approaching me with the same, you know. And that's, I guess, something that, you know, with, we, we are driven by financial rewards. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I always tell people, the rewards will come. Concentrate on the work that you've been assigned. It will take care of itself, the financial. So, talking about success, for me, I've already, I feel I'm successful where I, I can keep changing the goalpost. Today I'm saying, okay, I've got a bungalow, I want a bigger bungalow, I want five bungalows, I want bungalows all around the world. So, you know, and that's something that I get, the youth as well, they're losing it because they see all these, you know, when you open up, you see Mark Zuckerberg, you know, Facebook, billions, and you're chasing that. It's not possible. There's only one in seven billion. We all love to be Sachin Tendulkar. We're all growing up, you know, we play cricket, but there is only one Sachin Tendulkar. So, yes, let's aspire for that, but, you know, wait, let's not be so disappointed that, you know, you lose heart and you don't do anything just because you could not become Sachin Tendulkar. Maybe that bar is there, you want to become a Sachin, you'll become maybe, you know, Kohli, although Kohli is in the same, probably you might even cross uh, Sachin. But, you know, that's where, you know, I say that success, each of you don't just be driven by only financial. It could be success, could be another thing, like having ample free time. I don't have to do a nine to five. That could be success for me, that I'm at liberty to choose when I want to work. It's not necessarily the financial. Yes, part of it is financial because, you know, if you're financially secure, can you decide to do something like that? So, yes, don't just, I would just suggest, you know, or advise anybody listening in that please don't be driven only by the wealth and the money aspect of success. Mm -hmm. Please have a look at the overall and you'll be probably leading a much happier life. Uh, so how do you de-stress yourself? Any hobbies you want to share? Uh, hobbies? Watching Hindi movies. I love Hindi okay. movies. Uh, growing up in Africa, in my childhood, you know, as seven, eight year old, we would queue up in our days. We had something called a VHS system. We had those video cassette recorders, VCRs, VCPs. Uh, we would queue up when the movie released and Amitabh, in our part of the world, Amitabh Bachchan was the greatest. We had Mithun Chakravarti in those days. We would queue up and there was a two week waiting to get one VHS cassette. We had used to have a club run by, you know, Gujarati Indians out there. Um, and we would have a queue, you'd have to sign up. And let's say it was 10 rupees for a cassette, you, you were allowed to keep it for 24 hours. You had to return it the next day. So that was the passion we saw, you know, and, and I'm sure you, people see that, you know, how Bollywood has gone all over the world and it's a soft power that we have. So movies, definitely. Uh, one of my favorite movies, Three Idiots. Uh, has a lot of lessons in life. I, I've given it to people even at you know conferences and seminars. I've distributed three idiot movie just for the lessons that it got in in inside the movie um, and traveling. I think you know that's something that I'm lucky that I'm able to travel internationally. You get to see places when you get to uh, tr uh, you know travel. You get exposure again. The same thing coming back to my you know my schooling. Having seen so many nationalities, I'm always eager to see new places, learn. You know, I'm not very good at languages, uh, but a lot of people would love to pick up language wherever they go. Um, and just generally, you know, just appreciate, you know, s that a lot of times you see people are not as well off as you, even countries. We think that, you know, we have our issues in India. You might go to even certain countries in Europe, which are so-called, you know, the Western world. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of them struggling in their economies. 
they're desperate for Indian tourism to come in. Some of them depend on Indian tourism. So, you know, uh, coming back to, you know, people in India, growing up, education, we're all aspiring to go out to UK, US, because those are the lands of opportunities. We have enough in our own country, if you are able to focus. That's what also brings me back to India. So I'm, I'm lucky that I spend half the time in India and half the time in Africa. Uh, tell us something more about your family, how much time you get to spend with them. Okay, I have uh, uh, a wife and a seven-year-old. Um, one of my biggest regrets is, you know, you always have some regret, is that I don't have enough time, you know, to spend with them. Uh, so typically when you see with any, you know, sort of, you know, people on the move and all, I try and mix my, you know, work with pleasure. So I would take my family along, maybe I'm going on a conference or something, I'll take them along. I do Monday to Friday, Saturday, Sunday keep for them, we go out, enjoy the, you know, safari park or something like that. And that's, I guess, where, um, but I definitely like to give more time to family because end of the day, you're chasing all these things. And if you don't have time for your family, I guess it'll be a bit hollow. Uh, so at last, as a word of advice for the younger generation, uh, what does it take to be successful in life? I think it's passion. Uh, you must be very passionate about what you do. Um, success will take care of itself. Uh, if you are going to a job where, you know, when you're going to bed at night and let's say you're in an employment and you're like, oh, I don't want to get up in the morning and walk into that office, you're not going to be very successful. Um, personally, for me, I always look forward before going to bed. Sometimes I feel, you know, why doesn't everybody get up at five in the morning? Because I'm up till three in the morning talking to different parts of the world and I need to get a message across to some people, but they're sleeping. So I'm that eager to have a new day coming in. Just shows that the passion I've got. Second is you try new things, you know. You're gonna fail. Every person has failed in life. We all have failures. I've had my fair share of failures. Not I will have so many more going forward. But always try and pick yourself up. Go. It should not cost you too much. Um, example, you've just got 100,000 rupees in your bank balance. Don't take a risk where you're going to lose all of that, you know. So be calculative in your risk. But try and do something and learn from the mistakes and move on in life. I'm sure you, you, you will definitely, you know, create a goal, dream. I always say dream. Dreams do come true. Um, thank you so much for giving us your valuable time. And it was very nice talking to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Thank you. That's it. We could pack into this edition of the show. For more videos, subscribe to the channel Top News Networks.